We have now reached the fourth and final segment in this very long reading on alternative investments. And in this segment, we will talk about closely held companies, distressed securities, and commodities. First, closely held securities. And we need to understand what we mean by closely held companies or closely held securities. Essentially, these are equity or ownership shares which are not publicly traded and not subject to reporting and disclosure regulations. So as an example, if your uncle has set up a small private company, now this company obviously shares of this company might be held by three family members. So these shares are owned by the family members and these shares are obviously not publicly traded. So here we are talking about a closely held company. Now these closely held companies can take on several legal structures. They could easily, they could be corporations, they could be set up as partnerships or sole proprietorships and then within corporations they can be subcategories such as tax advantaged corporations or regular corporations and so on. But as long as you understand the point that closely held companies can take on a range of legal structures, that's what you really need to know. The other important point with closely held companies is that the legal definitions of intrinsic value, fundamental value and fair value can differ among different jurisdictions and these definitions can, can also differ from what you have studied in finance. So it is important then to understand the, the, law, the, the law related to closely held companies. And especially if there are some lawsuit issues or litigation issues and you need to determine the value of a given closely held company, how do you do that? And fortunately for us, we don't need to get into details, but all we need to know is that if there are any legal issues uh, and we need to determine the value, then we need to understand both finance as well as the law related to closely held companies. High level stuff, but that's what you need to know at this stage. Now, what we can very briefly cover is the different valuation approaches and this is purely from a finance perspective at this stage. These approaches might look familiar. So three possible approaches for valuing a closely held company. One is the cost approach. So you simply figure out what is the cost of getting the company to the level it currently is at. The second is a comparables approach where you try to find a comparable company, maybe a comparable public company, and then use the comparables to come up with the value of this closely held company. And finally, you can use an income approach, which essentially is the discounted cash flow approach. So you project the discount, project the cash flows, the net cash flows, and then discount back to come up with the value of the company. The curriculum just spends a few lines on each of these, so I don't think, uh, as long as you know these terms, I think that's fine. I don't expect uh, a quantitative question on this material. But at the high level, you should also understand the concept of discounts and premiums in the context of closely held companies. Let's say that based on these methods, you come up with a value for a closely held company to be 100 million. Then realize that since the shares of closely held companies are not very liquid and not very marketable, then if you are buying this company because of this lack of liquidity and marketability, what you will pay is less than the 100 million. So if you then actually pay only 95 million for this company, then essentially we are saying that there is a 5% discount due to lack of liquidity. Next, a discount for lack of control. So if you buy a 20% stake in the company mentioned above, and let's say that the other party has a 80% stake, 
clearly the control of the company is with this other majority owner who has 80% stake so you are to some extent at the mercy of the larger of the larger owner and hence if we simply go back to the value of 100 million and say 20% of 100 million is 20 million you might end up paying less than 20 million and uh, let's say if you pay 18 million that 2 million is a discount because of the lack of control premium for controlling interest uh, this should be obvious now if you are purchasing a controlling interest then you have the flexibility to to uh, improve the company operations and potentially increase the value of a company and if you do have a controlling interest then you might end up paying more than the value defined over here so that would be referred to as a premium for controlling interest again i don't expect uh, quantitative questions on this but as long as you understand these terms you should be fine next we'll talk about distressed securities and obviously the first question is what do we mean by distressed securities essentially we are talking about companies that are in financial distress and specifically companies which are either about to go bankrupt or have filed for bankruptcy protection or are trying to avoid bankruptcy through some form of debt restructuring and are trying to do this out of court so that's the basic definition now before we move on let's just understand that there is an inherent conflict between the bondholders and shareholders and this is going to be particularly apparent in distressed companies why because as you have studied before a company that might be going bankrupt and might have various liquidity issues bondholders have the first claim on the underlying assets so bond if the underlying assets can be sold for a certain amount of money the bondholders have the first claim on that and hence it might be in their incentive to just liquidate the company shareholders on the other hand will lose out if the company is liquidated and the money goes to bondholders hence what shareholders would really want is to somehow turn the company around so share prices go up because of this reason a common strategy to invest in distressed securities is through convertible bonds so the idea there is that an investor buys convertible bonds or invests in convertible bonds on the underlying distressed company and then hopefully if the company can be turned around then it would make sense to convert these bonds into equity so very often you see convertible bonds used in the context of distressed securities or distressed companies the characteristics of distressed securities investing you will notice that these are quite similar to what you saw for venture capital distressed security investing is obviously uh, the underlying security is clearly illiquid in the sense that if you do invest in such convertible bonds or even in equities chances are that it will take some time before you can make money on this so typically these will not be easy to sell at market price and obviously there is going to be a relatively long time horizon there is likely to be heavy involvement by investors so investors will have an interest in trying to turn the company around and get involved to some extent with management and strategic direction and essentially helping uh, change the fortunes of the company and extensive analytical work is involved because investors when when they are when they are evaluating a distressed company the one has to figure out whether it is possible to turn this company around so does the company have a viable business if the company purely has financial issues and you work out that as long as you solve the financial issues the underlying business of the company can be strong then it might make sense to make such investments so not only do you need to do your your financial models and your finance oriented calculations you also need to very carefully analyze the underlying business
which applies in general with equity investing but obviously more so with distressed securities and then distressed securities actually can be viewed as the ultimate form of value investing because with distressed securities the enterprise value or the market value of the security is going to be very low and potentially because this company is in distress it is possible that the enterprise value is even lower than what it should be and if you invest sensibly in distressed securities where there is potential for growth and where you are convinced that enterprise value is far lower than what it should be then there is a potential to make a lot of money on these investments finally we'll talk about investing in commodities and a core point with commodities is that it gives you exposure to a economy or a sector's growth a classic example is the textile sector so when the textile sector in your country is growing obviously the value of the underlying commodity which is cotton will go up commodity investment is mostly done indirectly so if you want to invest in cotton as a as an investor it's unlikely that you go buy many tons of cotton the more likely scenario is that you will invest in commodity futures and we have commodity futures for agricultural products such as cotton wheat corn etc metals such as gold silver copper energy and so on so we will have we have different commodity futures that are quite actively traded around the world we can also invest in bonds which are indexed to some commodity price so the payments that these bonds make go up based on the price of well defined or some defined underlying commodities or investors could buy stocks of companies that are producing commodities so if the underlying commodities become more valuable then the stock price of these companies will go up as we talk about the motivation and investment vehicles we should first understand a few critical points related to commodities one is that it's been historically seen that there is a relatively low to negative correlation with stocks and bonds so this means that the when we look at the correlation between commodities and stocks as well as the correlation between commodities and bonds this is relatively low now for a portfolio manager this is very important as i will describe very briefly and also we have noticed that there is a high correlation with unexpected inflation now these two points are extremely important why because if you are a passive investor and you are looking for a inflation hedge so when inflation goes up you want your underlying asset to go up so that would be an inflation hedge and given this high correlation that commodities have with unexpected inflation commodities provide a great hedge against inflation diversification benefit so that's this point over here given the relatively low correlation that commodities have with our classic investment investments in stocks and bonds clearly if this correlation is low then adding some commodity to our portfolio is going to give us a diversification benefit we don't need to get into the details but it has been shown that between a 5 to 10% Uh, if 5 to 10% of our portfolio is put in uh, commodities or some sort of a commodity index that gives a reasonable amount of diversification benefit so we can maybe keep the same expected return while reducing the riskiness of our portfolio and a, a general point that is made in this reading is that passive investors will be looking for an inflation hedge or a diversification benefit when they invest in commodities a commonly used investment vehicle when we talk about commodities is a collateralized futures fund this is offered by some financial institutions and the way it works is as follows if let's say you put in 1 million dollars into a collateralized futures fund what will happen is you will get a long position in a underlying futures contract 
which that futures contract might be based on some uh, investable index but nevertheless you if you put in 1 million dollars you get a long position in the futures contract and 1 million dollars worth of t bills are bought in your account so these t bills can be thought of as collateral so you have 1 million dollar collateral in the form of t bills and a 1 million dollar long position in the futures contract so what is your return now your there are fundamentally two sources of return if the contract value goes up then you benefit and obviously the return that you are getting on the t bills is also the second source of return for a investor in the collateralized futures fund in terms of active investors they are basically speculating on the near term direction of commodity prices so so active investors are essentially speculating if a speculator believes that the price of gold will go up he is not really worrying about inflation hedge or diversification benefit if he is simply speculating that gold prices will go up then we would refer to him as a active investor so that is it uh, we are done with this very long reading there are a lot of questions in the curriculum so i want you to practice those questions very hard if you have any comments in general about the about these four uh, parts that i have just gone over please uh, post your comments on youtube and if you liked these videos then please click on the like button if you found this clip interesting and informative please visit my website www.arifirfanullah.com here you will find a tremendous amount of useful material right here in the 2011 CFA video lecture series you will find the entire level 1 curriculum for free and most of the material here is still relevant so this is worth looking at the 2012 video lecture series covers both level 1 and level 2 these lectures are available for a fee and uh, finally down here uh, financial management at iba here you will find my lectures at iba uh, for a course on financial management plus you will find lots of useful spreadsheets that can help you with financial modeling so again please visit www.arifirfanullah.com thank you